So, welcome to our International Relations Career Advising Workshop. My name is Tom Dolan. For those of you who don't know me, I'm an assistant uh, professor in the Political Science Department, and I study international relations, which is why I put this together. Um, we do this workshop because a lot of times I talk to students who think that they're interested in a career somehow in international relations, but don't know what kind of careers exist and don't know how to pursue them. So we're trying to start to at least give you some sense of an answer to these questions today. Obviously, it's just a one-hour program, so we may not answer all questions. So feel free to stick around afterwards, talk to the people who, uh, myself and those others, who are presenting today, and certainly feel free to talk to me and other faculty members in the future if you have, as you have further questions. Now, the first thing I want to say is that uh, if you're interested, if you work hard, and make good choices in how you use your time in college, you can, in fact, make a successful start from UCF in an international relations career. And it's always been true. One of the first graduates of UCF, when it was Florida Technical College, was a guy named Roy Werner, who spent time afterwards working for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and eventually became Corporate Director of Research at Northrop Grumman, which is a very large uh, defense and aeronautics corporation. Uh, we have recent, more recent graduates working in all the major branches of government that I'm aware of. Uh, the UN, and a wide variety of other kinds of international positions. Right now, we have students who are doing internships with the State Department, the UN, and we actually have a couple at the White House right now. So these things are certainly available to you if you make good, solid choices and if you work hard. So, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to make some of those choices, uh, important decisions, um, and we're also going to talk about the kind of career paths that are available to you uh, and how to get those. So I'll start off by talking a little bit about these different kinds of career paths. Probably the most familiar to you uh, is academia, because you know professors who study your natural relations and teach it to you. Uh, my job essentially involves teaching and research uh, and trying to publish in academic journals. There's a clear uh, requirement for this. You have to get a PhD. The next kind of career is in the federal executive branch. When we think about federal executive branch jobs, what we mean are people who are experts working for the government in some capacity or another, working for a federal agency. Usually something like the State Department, the CIA, uh, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, or your Homeland Security, Energy, Commerce, Agriculture, Justice, or a wide variety of others. But the key thing here is, is you're working in some sense as an expert for the government. Another kind of career is the DC policy community. So these are people who work in things like think tanks, uh, the congressional committee staffs, foundations. There's usually an element of expertise in this kind of career, but there's also an element of policy advocacy in this kind of career. If you decide that you want to someday be the national security advisor or the secretary of state, you're probably better off going this route than going into the federal executive branch. He's exactly one foreign service officer has ever become Secretary of State, and even if I told you his name, you wouldn't know. Next, international organizations. Again, doing a kind of expert work. There are two major kinds of international organizations you can work for. One is intergovernmental organizations, the other is non-governmental organizations. Intergovernmental organizations are organizations to which states belong. So we're talking about things like the United Nations, the World Bank, the Organization of American States, the International Atomic Agency, the International Atomic Energy Agency. In a lot of respects, working for an intergovernmental organization is a lot like working for a, uh, the federal government, except you're not working for the federal government, you're working for a lot of states instead of just one. But once again, it's a, it's a kind of civil service expertise-oriented job. The other kind of job is non uh, international organizations, non-governmental. So these are international organiz uh, organizations, institutions, things like international, like Amnesty International, or Red Cross, or Oxfam, or Human Rights Watch. A lot of times these involve some kind of development work, but not necessarily. For instance, uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross, its function is to ensure that prisoners of war aren't being mistreated, and so it hires people in their 20s who speak English and French go to war zones and see if the prisoners of war are being appropriately treated. Another kind of career path is private industry. 
So there are lots of different kinds of private industry, business, that involves international relations in some way. Uh, one part of this could be in helping companies interact with foreign governments. Uh, sometimes this involves you know, a, a knowledge of the law and some kind of a law degree, although not necessarily a traditional law degree. Another is uh, the field of political analysis. And the, the, the purpose of political analysis, political risk analysis, is to help companies make good decisions about what countries to spend their money in and how to avoid those countries that are going to take their money from them. And of course, there are also defense contractors, sometimes, if it, uh, sometimes by my friends called the merchants of death. And these provide governments with everything from intelligence analysis to weapon systems to, in a couple of cases, which I'm not encouraging you necessarily to work for, actual mercenaries. These can be uh, interesting and exciting jobs as well. A lot of times in the United States, they work for the federal government as their main customer, but then sometimes other uh, governments as well usually governments that are sort of friends of the United States. And then, of course, you can also just have a, a normal career in a foreign country, that is, having a career as an expatriate. Uh, and that could be something like teaching or a regular business uh, in a foreign country. I think an important step in finding the right kind of career path for you is deciding, is making decisions about the kind of life you want to lead. So why do you want to work in international relations? Do you want to try and change the world for the better, or are you just interested in the subject? Are you an idealist? Do you want to help people? Or is that not, you know, or is there something else that drives you into this field? You also need to think about things like, do you want to make money or not? If you want to work in a, for a non-governmental organization, the answer is you're not going to make much money. You may change the world, but you won't change the world while being rich. Working in private industry, you'll probably make more money. However, you may have to make some trade-offs uh, about what you're doing. So it's hard to be an idealist, for instance. I work for a defense contractor in many cases. You also have to make decisions about how long you want to work during the day. So the DC policy community, the people who want to be national security advisors, these are the sorts of people who are working all the time. There's always the Blackberry or the Twitter. And these are people who work 60 hours a week. If, on the other hand, you say, no, 40 hours a week, and that's all I want to do, some, some uh, government jobs or civil service jobs may be more appropriate to the kind of lifestyle that you, that you want to be. Now, they can't necessarily promise it'll always just be 40, but that's, that's the more common tendency. And you want to think about who do you want to work for? Do you want to work for the US government? Do you want to work, for, what about foreign governments? Are you okay working on their behalf? Or do you not like governments at all, and you want to not work for a government? It's important to think about these things because ultimately you're going to be spending an awful lot of time in your job. You want a job that's going to make you happy rather than unhappy uh, every time you go there. I'd also uh, kind of as a, as, a, as a starting point point out that for most of these kinds of career paths, because they involve some kind of expertise, you're probably you should probably expect to pursue a master's degree of some sort within about five years or so. So that's in the future. What about now? What do you do at UCF? The first thing I want to tell you is that these are all competitive fields, and getting a job in them is not necessarily easy. So you need to tell yourself right now that you're going to find ways to work hard and self set yourself apart. Sometimes people imagine that luck or connections or that person that their uncle knows is going to get them a job, but usually that's not the case. Uh, so don't rely on some kind of magic bullet. Instead, the only bullet that works is hard work. And you need to plan. You need to figure out what you want to look like when you're graduating. What's your resume going to look like when you're done at UCF? Is it going to be something that's going to help you, or is by, by allowing you to stand out, or is it something that's going to look like a couple other uh, hundred resumes that are also sitting in the same pile with it? Right? So you want to think about things that can do that. Part of that is going to be carefully structuring your courses. So you want to pursue things that are interesting to you, but you also want to pursue things in a way that makes sense. So for instance, if you want to do something involving foreign policy, you should probably take a course in foreign policy. You want to pursue further graduate study or pursue a PhD, you should probably think about doing an honors in the major kit. Um, 
you want to do something that involves business or economics in any way, take an economics course. Something that I think you should take regardless are some math courses and statistics courses. Math never goes away, and I'm told it's only getting more important. And frankly, I don't really consider people to be truly educated unless they at least know some calculus. Ironically enough, perhaps, many of our students, our graduates, after they've been away for a few years, tell us that our scope and methods course, which has involved, is the required course and has some statistics in it, is one of the more useful courses that they took while they, was, they were here. So make sure you do that, well, you have to do that. Make sure you do well in that. And think about going beyond that. Think about pursuing some statistics course beyond that. Foreign language, a very useful thing. UCF requires a year to graduate. Let me tell you, a year of Spanish isn't going to get you anywhere. Probably not even directions in Spain. What you need, then, is to move towards fluency in whatever language that you do. And when we say fluency, I don't just mean the ability to understand what someone's saying to you. I also mean the ability to write fluently in that language at a professional level. If you can write fluently at a professional level in a language, you've got a real asset. That's particularly true for a language like Spanish or French or Italian, which are relatively frequently taught uh, at the undergraduate level. If you take a, a language that isn't as frequently taught at the undergraduate level or is more challenging some way, like Chinese or Hindi, you don't necessarily need to reach full fluency for it to be an asset, uh, but you know, just having started those is, uh, is often uh, enough to, to get you noticed, if you would. And the US government has a list of critical needs languages uh, that you can refer to if you're not sure. Other things can be useful. Computer skills, Excel, maybe, some, maybe a basic accounting course. These are things you should do beyond the classroom, though, too. You should read the newspaper, a real newspaper, every day. Real newspapers are things like the New York Times or the Washington Post, not the USA Today. There's a reason why it's free in lots of places. You should think about the extracurricular activities you do. There are some which might seem immediately relevant, like Model UN, and those can be good, but also find other places, perhaps, to gain leadership skills and, and, and expertise. To, to, to have opportunities to manage people, manage budgets. Um, take advantage of undergraduate research programs. We're going to have someone talk about those here in a minute. But those can often be very useful and valuable in helping setting you apart. Uh, and then take advantage of things that you may not even think about, but like the library. The library has subscriptions to all sorts of journals. Go over and read them sometime. See what people are thinking beyond just what's happening in the classroom. There are talks put on uh, around campus by people like the Global Perspectives Program from time to time. Go to them. And don't just go to them, you know? Maybe if you have a question and they think get answered in the general Q&A session, go up to the person and, and start a conversation. Beyond UCF, two things that can be interesting and sometimes useful are internships and study abroad. Now, I personally strongly encourage students to do internships, and particularly to do internships off campus uh, at some point in their junior or senior year. There's several reasons for this. First of all, it gets you experience. You know, it, just, it shows that you've been out of, you've done something besides just be in a classroom all the time. It can help you build, uh, find a network of people who do what you want to do, who can be useful to you. It can help you find a mentor, someone who can provide guidance for you about how to get the kind of job that they have. can help you figure out if that's the kind of job you want to have or not. Many years ago when I was an undergraduate, I did a, an internship at a think tank. And by the end of the summer, I was sure that whatever I did, I was not going to work in a think tank. Right? It's an awful lot better to figure that out while you're a junior in college than to figure that out once you've gone to graduate school to do what you want to do and wasted two or six years of your life. Or, once you're already getting paid to do it, and so leaving it is, is a little bit more complicated. That said, though, be careful with your time. Not all internships are created equally. I usually recommend that people interested in international relations do not take an internship with their local congressman's district office. Because all you'll do is sit in an office somewhere here in Orlando, Florida, and respond to letters from crazy people and take phone calls from crazy people and try very, very hard to be nice to them. 
Well, that is at some level a basic skill in life. I'm not sure it's the best way for you to be spending your time. You should also think about ways to be creative. Um, sometimes opportunities can come across, you can come into the opportunities uh, without having a plan for it. So when I was an undergraduate and studied abroad, I found that I had an awful lot more time than I expected to, and than I'd had as an undergraduate in the United States. And I was in Scotland, so I used, I, I made some phone calls, and uh, every day, or once a week, uh, I spent a day down at the Scottish Parliament working for their uh, European Committee. It's not something I planned for, but you know, I found myself in a, in a place and I made a few phone calls and tried. The worst they could have said was no, but they said yes. Next thing, studying abroad. Studying abroad can be a, a valuable and even life-changing experience. And that can be true for sometimes short programs that are offered of a couple weeks or studying abroad in a foreign university for a full semester. There are right ways and wrong ways to study abroad. Sometimes, study abroad groups are organized such that it's just a bunch of American students who stick together and essentially drink together for a few weeks in Europe, or a whole semester. I'm not convinced you get nearly as much out of that kind of experience uh, as you might is in a situation where you're forced to actually engage in natives, or engage with natives uh, on a regular basis, in which you actually are actively enrolled in courses with people from France or China or wherever you're studying abroad. So it can be done better and it can be done worse. And you need to make sure uh, you're doing it in ways that are, are, are maximally useful for you. Uh, there is a, the International, the Office of International Affairs manages study abroad through UCF. I'd encourage you to go and talk to them. Um, and go and talk to them even if you're not sure this is something you want to do or are able to do. They often suggest going and talking to them if it seems right for your degree program and for right for what you're studying, and maybe then figuring out if there's a way to afford it, because sometimes there are ways to afford it that you may not recognize in advance. Okay. Next, you're going to hear from our Office of Career Services.